It's my huge pleasure to welcome today's guest, Lewis Lockwood, who of all Beethoven scholars needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, Lewis Lockwood is one of the leading authorities on Beethoven worldwide. Having taught at Princeton and Harvard, some of his key Beethoven publications include his biography, Beethoven, the Music and the Life, um, published by Norton in 2003, as well as Beethoven's Symphonies and Artistic Vision, also Norton 2015, and with the Juilliard String Quartet in Beethoven, Inside Beethoven's String Quartet's History, Performance, Interpretation, published by Harvard University Press in 2008. Um, he is known for his studies of Beethoven's life and work, including the composer's autograph manuscripts and sketchbooks. And we are here today to talk about his latest book, Beethoven's Lives, The Biographical Tradition, which was published um, last year by Boydell Press. And it's a critical survey of Beethoven biography beginning the year of his death and continuing um, to, the, to the modern era. And in fact, there have been some new biographies published even since you wrote this book. So um, it's a, a field that's ongoing, extremely rich, and continues to be a huge source of fascination. So thank you very much for joining us today from the East Coast of the United States. And uh, we're going to be talking about your book, You and I, for about half an hour, and then we'll open up the discussion for questions from people who are present here. Um, so to all of our very welcome guests, um, you are welcome to use the chat function, which is along the bottom of your screen. Um, on the screen I'm currently looking at, there's a little button that says more and three dots. If I click on more, one of the things that come up is chat. So that is the place where um, I will take questions and put them to Lewis Lockwood so that you can ask him questions about his own book or about the things that we've been talking about today. So um, I would like to, to start by asking you about this issue of Beethoven biography. Um, your book contains dozens of um, biographies. And like I say, there's been more published um, even in the past year. So first up, I would like to ask you, why do you think Beethoven's life continues to be such an appealing subject? Uh, well, the, the first thing way I'm going to answer that, and first of all, is to thank you, Erica, for inviting me to do this. And uh, I'm looking forward greatly to what I hope will be discussion and mutual enlightenment as far as we can make it happen. And uh, do my best to answer questions, but also to raise issues which may be in the minds of others who are part of this uh, afternoon's discussions and see where we get. So I hope it will be as interactive as we might be able to make it. Now, uh, if the question is something like, uh, how did I come to do this book? Or what do I have in mind by it? Let me try and offer what is inevitably a kind of, of shorthand explanation to begin with, but one which will resonate. Well, the first thing is to say that we live in the age of music uh, in which there are two divisions, classical and pop. Uh, on the Sunday New York Times art section, they don't even have to say pop music. They say only pop and everybody knows what that is. And classical is music. Well, no, no one here needs to be reminded that Beethoven was, is one of the titanic figures in the world of classical music. The, the canon, as it's known, uh, has him very much, of course, in a, a leading position, a position in which his music is already so familiar to so many people to some degree, at least some of his major works are, are familiar. There's a vast amount that isn't so familiar, but that's inevitable. But the familiar and great works are household uh, items in people's memory and experience. Then the question arises, how can, we, how can people in general gain better understanding and enlarge their view of what Beethoven was and what he did and why we should care. And I think 
that one of the obvious questions that has to be asked is what mode of approach is going to be chosen? Well, there is needless to say a substantial vast literature of what I will call analysis of Beethoven's works, ranging from very rigorous analysis of many, many different kinds through to criticism, which had, takes often a more literary form than, than rigorous analysis. But that, that is not a world that is open to the vast public for whatever reasons. Let's leave that question aside. What is open to people and can be dealt with though by readers and by listeners is the, all that accrues to the enormous question, who was it that made these works? What was his life like? In what kind of age did he live? And what did he overcome in order to do what he did? How did he proceed and what, what were the imperatives that guided his development? So every biographer to some degree has to reckon with some of these questions and we all do. And I would say this, most of my earlier work, I came into the field of Beethoven studies having already done work in the Italian Renaissance, which may seem a little far away, but it, it, is, de it is as rich in its own way, of course, as any other subject. And one thing it did was make me an Italophile for life, by the way, which is a good thing to have happen. Consequently, going, coming into the world of Beethoven studies, I was going back to the music that I'd been playing as a cellist since I was a teenager and playing in chamber music and orchestras and becoming interested in issues about the great music written for the ensembles I was playing in. One comes to Beethoven immediately. And once you get there, you find out that a good deal is known and that there's a vast tradition, but there's a great deal more to do. And indeed, even now, there is an enormous amount still to do, as those of us think, who think of the subject as a field of inquiry, a branch of knowledge, a way of enlarging our experience. So that's pretty broad, I think, Erica, so far, but will it do for the moment as a, an opening wedge? Absolutely, yes. And of course, there is a lot still to do, but there's an awful lot that has been done already. And that's a challenge for everyone working in the field is to get to grips with the enormous wealth of scholarship that already exists. Um, and I, I feel that uh, in a way, I don't know if you agree with this, but part of the job of biographers is to sort of peel back some of the um, meaning that has accrued around Beethoven over, over the past two centuries. Um, we often talk about a mythology around mm -hmm. Beethoven. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder what you think of the role of biography in shaping that myth of, of the Beethoven that's the kind of cultural icon that we know. Uh, well, let me try and approach it this way. Um, the mythology, the, the, the mythologizing of Beethoven, the feeling that he was a kind of godlike figure goes back very far in the early 19th century. I think in the opening part of my book, I cite the words of Charles Halle, who founded the Halle Orchestra in England in, about in, uh, in the early 19th century, who writes, when Beethoven died, I felt as if a god had died. This is a godlike figure for musicians already in across Europe and in the United States as well, by the way. The arrival of Beethoven in the United States in the early 19th century is a very interesting and complex story of our cultural development. And it was profoundly important, particularly in the Northeast and in New England. No, no localizing, no local band flag waving intended here, I assure you. I'm a New Yorker by background. But uh, the reason the mythologizing in a sense became never left its work during the 19th century and it takes on a, an important form of iconography, by the way, in which Beethoven is presented by great many artists as a godlike figure. The uh, cover design on my book, if I may or might show that for a second, if I don't know if this works or not, but it, it's there. 
is a version of a statue of a, of a sculptured figure of Beethoven by Max Klinger made around 1902. This is a small version of a very large naked Beethoven sitting on a throne, which is found in the famous Vienna, Vienna Secessions Hall, which is a monument to Beethoven as a figure. This is in the time of Mahler and early Schoenberg. So it is still, the, God, the mythologizing did not cease. It takes on different forms in different periods, but it never leaves completely. Uh, to what degree it may still be present in the minds of musicians, audiences, and others. I'm not quite sure now, but ours is, ours is not an age necessarily in which godlike figures in art are still worshipped. I'll leave that for further development, perhaps. Yes, and speaking of godlike figures and hero worshipping, I'd like to talk a little bit about Richard Wagner, because he he appears in your book in a quite surprising way, um, in a way that I didn't know about, that he was planning to write a biography of Beethoven early in his, in his own uh, career. Could you speak a little about that? Oh, it, it, it is a quite extraordinary little story in the world, in the Wagnerian world. Uh, Wagner, born in 1813, is of course a teenager in the 18, late 1820s, and one of his first actions as a, as a growing musician was to do nothing less than transcribe the entire Ninth Symphony of Beethoven for piano two hands. I mean, all of it. The autograph still exists. You can find it with ease in the Wagner literature. It's on the cover of more than one Wagner book. And Wagner's feelings about Beethoven began uh, as, as with many musicians of his time as one who felt this is the great model I have to work against or work with, learn from, and in various ways grow against. Wagner became a Beethoven uh, idolater very early and stayed that way throughout his life, even as his own development transformed him into one of the great composers of all time, and also one of the great egotistical composers of all time, I need hardly say. His early essay, A Pilgrimage to Beethoven, is written in around 1840 when he is in Paris. And now I'll come to this question of his possibly thinking, believe it or not, of writing a biography. Wagner in 1840 has the Flying Dutchman ready, pretty much, but it's not quite produced yet. And he is on the way to forging his career. In the Wagner literature, one comes across studies of Wagner and Beethoven. And one of the very best that I have read is the book by Cla the late Klaus Kropfinger entitled Wagner and Beethoven, originally in German, translated also into English. And the, in the rich footnote material, which is in the German edition, you find a great deal about what he was up to and, every period of his life about Beethoven. But in the 1840s, the young Wagner searching for to get his career moving, possibly in France at that time, if he could, comes across an extraordinary figure by the name of Gottlob Engelbert Anders, A-N-D-E-R-S. Now, weirdly, Anders, which means other, isn't actually the man's name, it turns out, but all of that is a subsidiary aspect of the story. Anders was originally from Bonn, is working as a librarian in a Paris library at the time, and Wagner gets to know him, and Anders is a Beethoven enthusiast par excellence. And it appears that they get together with the idea of patching and putting, of joining together, joining forces to write a truly good Beethoven biography. Schindler's first edition just comes out at this time and Wagner has a very bad opinion of it, which he expresses in no uncertain terms. He thinks it's clumsy. He thinks it's, it's almost true hero worshiping and it's not satisfactory. It's certainly not satisfactory to him. So apparently he and Anders hatch a plan to write a new Beethoven biography that would sweep the field. And it will be not only uh, 
truly worthy as Wagner sees it of Beethoven's artistic greatness, but it will also, he says in letters, be thorough and well-documented. Now, nothing ever came of this, but Wagner did propose the book to more than one publisher. All of this you can find in Kropfinger's excellent book, Wagner and Beethoven. And it's one of the most curious chapters in Wagner's life that he thought he would be a music historian for a while, not very long, as you can imagine. Can I leave it at that? Yes, that's that's wonderful. Um, and there's another surprising figure um, that's kind of on the other end of the spectrum from Wagner that you also mentioned in your survey of 19th century biographer, and that is Gustav Nottebohm. Uh, and surprising in the sense that Nottebohm was a Beethoven scholar who studied the sketches and manuscripts, but he did not write about Beethoven's life. He didn't write about the Heiligenstadt Testament and, and you know, that aspect of Beethoven. Um, so why did you make that decision to include Nottebohm in this uh, survey? Fine. In the course of my work, my own work on Beethoven, Nottebohm has been a guiding star for many, many, many years. Nottebohm is the founding father of the study of Beethoven's sketchbooks. Uh, all thousands of pages of them, of course, he lived in Vienna. He most of the material he worked where he wanted to work with was in Berlin. And I often will say to a, a student to think about what what Nottebohm had to work with when he was busy doing this from his lair in Vienna, where he was a friend of young Brahms. He had his musicality, his intelligence, music paper, and a train ticket. Now, in the course of his work, his work as we we have it. Uh, consists of a large stream of essays compiled in two books, Beethoveniana and Zweite Beethoveniana, meaning second Beethoven collection. The second Beethoven collection is published in 1881 after Nottebohm's premature death. And his editor was Eusebius Mandachevsky, an extremely intelligent and, and, and well-schooled musician and editor. And in the preface, to this second Beethovenjana, all of Nottebohm's, with most of Nottebohm's important essays on sketchbooks, we find the following preface. This work is biographical. That is, quote, it deals with the working artist, end quote. Now, I'm shortening the quotation, but that's essentially what it says. That sentence should bring us up short a little bit and say, are, don't most biographies deal with the working artist? And the answer is, not most of the time, no, because the relationship between life and works is so complex and so filled with material on either side, especially in Beethoven's case, that not too many biographers will have the opportunity or the possibility to do more than allude to the enormous amount of creative material that survives for us showing the, the Beethoven's work as a working composer, but you can't include everything. Every biography has its own shape, its own purpose, its own range of issues which must be addressed. And so it's the case. No, of course, Beethoven, no, Nottebohm did not, of course, write a biography, that wasn't his way. But what he did do, is comment, if you look at the footnotes of Nottebohm's second Beethovenjana, you'll find many comments on Schindler, on Thayer, on points of chronology, on certain little things. So he was well aware of the literature. One good way of putting it is to say this, none of us can do everything, whatever quote, everything might be said to be, but he belongs all the same. And that's why I put him in. And if we could just pick up a little more on that question of what, what gets left out of biography and every biography, like you say, has to put forward a position and make decisions about what goes in and what goes out. Um, so I'd like to ask you about your own biography, The Music and the Life, yeah. um, and what kind of decisions you made when you set out to tell a new version of Beethoven's biography at that, at that point. Well, let, let me 
it, it's, as you can imagine, not easy to sum up in a few words, but I'll do what I can about that. Uh, I say again, I came fundamentally to Beethoven as a musician, and that's where I still am and always will be. But in the meantime, it was very clear to me that there was a vast world of biographical information and knowledge and exploration that one needed to understand and deal with. And so, of course, I, uh, like many of my colleagues, uh, read, did read and do read as thoroughly as possible across the whole field. In my time, one of my uh, closest contemporaries happened to be Maynard Solomon. And when in 1977, Solomon's biography came out, it was a very important moment in the history of Beethoven biography, as well as being a very original and important work in its own right. Not without controversy, of course, because of Solomon's interest in Freudian analysis and uh, interpretation of issues in Beethoven's complicated life along Freudian lines, but by no means is that an essential dimension of his understanding. A great deal of Solomon's work is also extremely thoroughly grounded in the source materials. I could say more about that, maybe I will later. But in any case, Solomon's work was quite important for me, not, al not alone, of course. I had already had been fortunate enough to have a course at graduate school in Princeton with Elliot Forbes. At the time, he was revising Thayer's Life of Beethoven for publication. Uh, every book has its own history, and Thayer's work has a very complicated one, originally published only in German, not at all in English, not ever fully finished for the late years, translated as much as possible by Frey Beale in the 1900, early 1900s and came out about 1920 with Frey Beale's version of the late years and based on Thayer's papers. By the time Elliot Forbes came to it, to the material, Thayer's papers had disappeared. They have, by the way, never yet been found. A tragedy, I believe, because Thayer was by far the most painstaking factual biographer of Beethoven and how fortunate we are to have his work come in the forms we have it. So uh, my own work included Thayer, included Solomon, the idea of it. And I wasn't sure I was going to write a biography until I was persuaded to do that by my old friend, Michael Ox, who was then the book editor for W.W. W. Norton. And so I set out to see what I could do about it. But to put a whole, a large amount of uh, feeling and content into a, a simple sentence, best I can, I had still had the feeling I wanted the music to be in front and the life along with it, as opposed to the other way around. And in that way, my book is a kind of counterpart to Maynard's, I think, as I felt it anyway. Does that have any help? It is very much. Okay. Um, there's something I really enjoyed about your book, uh, your, about your survey of the biographers, which is your reflection on the nature of artistic biography more generally. Um, because, of course, there's a very rich Beethoven biographical tradition, but you also mention reflecting on um, biographies of literary figures and scientists and artists and how all of these biographers grapple with the essential question of the relationship between an artist's life and their work. Yeah, it's a tremendous question. It's something we will not come to the end of because I'm not even sure where the end would be or how to phrase the, the, the issue intelligently. But I'll just say it, the question lies in front of all of us who think about how was it that this person did what this person did and what was it were the conditions that made it possible and which were favorable to it and may have been less than favorable, but which had to be overcome. Well, uh, in Beethoven's case, the deafness is of course a fundamental question. Everybody, the, I mean, there are of course en endless books on the subject and studies 
and the issue of the importance of the deafness to his work takes a different form in the writings of different biographers. That's something you find out when you read enough in this field. I grew up with a wonderful book by J.W.N. Sullivan, Beethoven, uh, on Beethoven, which I'm sure many may still be reading, written around 1927. Sullivan was in the circles around Aldous Huxley and other English writers of the time. It's no accident that Huxley wrote, by the way, a novel called Point Counterpoint, and that late Beethoven in particular was is coming fully into the cultural world of the Anglo-Saxon and American world of intellectual interests. Sullivan's whole thesis is that the overcoming of the deafness is the key to understanding the substance of Beethoven's works, not simply his life. That is to say, for Sullivan, the odd numbered symphonies, starting with number three, we leave one and two alone here because they don't quite count in his world as much, but starting with the Eroica and the third, the fifth, the seventh, and of course, colossally, the ninth are works in which overcoming is represented in various ways that one can aesthetically spell out. I won't try to put it further in detail, but I think anybody who knows the works, and I'm sure that includes people today, know exactly what I mean. So for Sullivan, the problem is that works like symphonies numbers two, four, six, and eight are lesser works because they do not, in, not entail or seem to represent in some way the kind of power of, of expression and the emotional adventure, the line of development which he perceives in the odd numbered symphonies. Well. It feels like something you could believe for a few minutes, but when you think about it further, there's an enormous problem here, namely that symphonies numbers four, six, and eight are masterpieces of a different kind. And that it would appear if they are that Beethoven didn't always have to be representing overcoming of, deaf, of deafness or any other of his fallibilities in his music in that way. Doesn't mean that Sullivan's was not a great book and many people love it and swear by it and they should but it represents a mode of approach that is uh, in a sense, highly redolent of an ideology uh, which wants to see the life in the works directly as opposed to in the background to some degree, the life here being the deafness disability. So that's one, one aspect of the of a, of a way of representing something of a problem. One thing I suggested in my book, and be glad if people would think about this this way and help me with this is this. I think it makes some sense in Beethoven's case to see, to make a kind of distinction between two dimensions of the man's life. One is what we'll call the life altogether, the life tout court, the life all, all in one, all the encounters, ex experiences, uh, ups and downs, aspirations, triumphs, disappointments, everything, sicknesses, all right. The other dimension of all that is what I'll call the career. Interesting that when people, when literary people read Beethoven's letters, they get a little tired of them because they're full of letters to publishers whom he's bothering and who bother him. And that's what he's writing about is why don't they do what they're supposed to do and get his works out properly and quickly and pay him right away. My goodness, uh, this is not a, a godlike figure. This is a man running a business. It's a career. And to have to create his works, it was absolutely essential that he have a career in the sense in which I mean it, in which he could not only write his, have write his works and be tremendously motivated to do so, but have them realized in print, get sold and performed through the world. And indeed, the result of all this was that it happened that he becomes the most famous composer in, in Europe of his time, that during the Congress of Vienna, he is the composer that the potentates want to have performed. 
that the patrons uh, do their best, at least for the most part, when they're doing something good to support him. But nevertheless, he always feels that he is their superior in a very important way. And now we're not in the career anymore, but we're in that part of Beethoven in which he is feeling that my works really can't be sold. One of my favorite quotations of all time is in the, is in the 1820s, his draft letter on a possible collected edition of his works. You'll find it at the end of Anderson, volume three. The human brain is not for sale like any form of cheese, says Beethoven. And he goes on in lurid detail what cheese is made of, which I'll spare you today. Well, uh, I think about sentence. I remember saying that, giving that sentence at the end of a lecture. And I remember Milton Babbitt saying to me at the end of the lecture, quote, did he really say that? And the answer is yes, he said that. Well, that's the artist speaking. All this any help, Erica? Absolutely. I mean, I could carry on this conversation for for hours and listen to your fascinating insights about these big questions around biography and artistic biography as well. Um, I'm conscious that there have been some really interesting comments in the chat, and um, I think it would be nice to open up the floor now to questions from people um, who would like to, to ask you something about perhaps your own work or anything that's come up today. So um, I know that some questions have also been emailed in, so my colleague Janice uh, might be dropping some, um, some previous questions in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just scrolling through the chat now, and there's a question here from Richard Sogg, um, who asks, how advanced was Beethoven's hearing loss when he composed the bird song of birds in Symphony Number no. 6? Mm. Well, we're in, with, the six, with the Pastoral Symphony, we're, we're in about 187 or so, 188. And he already has uh, lost enough hearing so that he's complaining that he can't hear very conversation very well, but he still manages it to some degree. We're still 10 years or so before we come to the conversation books, which don't begin until 1818. The question of the degree of hearing loss is a complicated and tenuous one on which to feel confident. The latest very good book on the whole subject is by Robin Wallace, Hearing Beethoven. It's a new survey of all the known information and evidence about the hearing loss from early on. It's, and uh, I recommend it very highly. As for whether he could still hear the birds, his love of nature is so strong that he must have had a mental image of what they sounded like from when he could hear, for one thing. And beyond that, I'm afraid it's a matter of speculation as to what degree he was actually hearing or remembering and having oral memory of what he felt the birds sounded like. I'll just say this much also, the birds are very important in, at the end of the, ninth, of the Sixth Symphony. And you'll find that in the autograph manuscript, Beethoven writes a note to the copyist telling him in no uncertain words to put the names of the birds into the score. Uh, I also like the fact that the clarinets are two. We are the cuckoos, so that there are two cuckoos, by the way. Uh, from my friend Theodore Albrecht, who knows who played every instrument as, as many performances of Beethoven's works as a historian can know, we could probably find out who were the two clarinetists who had to represent the cuckoos at the time. This I can say is speculation, but with Robin Wallace in hand, you get further than before. Great, I have another question here from Mike Gersh in the chat, um, which may have been posed before you talked about Solomon in the interview. Um, so this was about the Solomon 19, 19, 1977 biography. Um, mm. The question is, a noted Beethoven scholar recently told me he's had to reconsider the lofty perch he had previously held for Solomon's biography. What's your view of that important biography more than 40 years after its publication? In other words, should I read it again? 
Oh, well, sure, absolutely should read it again, but best better in the 1998 revision, which was substantial and which included a good deal of discussion of many issues that Solomon had talked about in 1977. Um, Solomon is willing to engage with issues which are, uh, which to many people are not lucid and immediately visible. And that's why it's complex. He's, he's he takes on complexities and uncertainties to a degree that few biographers had done before. Um, the best way to think about Solomon's work is to think back to the general large state of things before him, starting always with Thayer. Thayer came into the world of Beethoven biography in the 1850s and started with the purpose of finding out what were the true facts of Beethoven's life as far as he could determine them. So this American guy went over to Germany, thought himself German, found colleagues, interviewed as many Beethovenians as he could possibly find who were still alive. There's a wonderful interview of him with Schindler, by the way. And we would now think, what could they have had in common? Well, here's the kind of man that Thayer turns out to have been. He recognizes that Schindler is what he calls one of the best abused men in Germany because many German critics were horrified by Schindler's hero worship and fawning approach and self-importance. They didn't yet know about the fabrication, but it was already enough for them. But they said all the same, this is a person who should at least be given some credibility. And I think what that had to do with was the fact that he was seeing a person, a man, who had literally been there. He'd been in the room with Beethoven. What he, what he said and what he, what, he fabric, what he might have fabricated, well, it was hard to tell, and it still is, by the way, to some degree, but it was still important. Solomon's book attempts to encompass the many, many vital issues in Beethoven's life in a very highly professional and lucid way. And very, uh, with a, a great sense of responsibility to the facts. What became notorious, of course, was his, his discussion of the immortal beloved and his assignment of the, of the identity to Antony Brentano. But his discussion of that in his book and in his journal articles, which are often more extensive than what's in the book, is very convincing to me. And it remains so even now. There is an article by him about Josephine Dime, D-E-Y-M, who is the alternative figure for many people's identification of the immortal beloved. I'll leave all that to further reading. If the question is, should Solomon still be read? The answer is emphatically yes. Um, I'd like to pick up on Schindler because scouring through the chat, there's a, a relevant question here from Fabio Bonabito. Um, who asks, are you angry at Schindler for tampering with the Beethoven sources? Uh, yes. Um, between uh, anger and, and pathos, uh, it's tragic. Schindler was an extraordinary uh, person in lots of ways, but not in positive, extra, not positive ways. He found his way to Beethoven in the 1820s and then let it be known that he'd been there for 10 years. Uh, well, it wasn't true, but he might have known him slightly while working elsewhere in Vienna. But he was a working violinist and he found his way into Beethoven's inner circle in the 1820s uh, and was around during the whole project which brought the Ninth Symphony into the public sphere in 1824. So he had a lot to do with it. Uh, Beethoven apparently despised him. We can tell from Beethoven's excoriating remarks in various letters and in, uh, I think, in conversation books also, but certainly it's well attested that he thought he was a miserable fellow and fired him pretty much over the question of what happened to all the money that was made by the 1824 Ninth Symphony concert. So that's part of it. And then at the end of Beethoven's life, Schindler shows up again and takes the conversation books into his own hands, takes many other things too, including a number of sketchbooks, and becomes, sets himself up as the, so to speak, appointed heir of Beethoven biography. 
he has to do combat with others, of course, for the same rank, for the same purpose. Uh, what I will call the boys from Bonn, who were Wegeler and Ries in particular, are getting ready to bring or will bring, bring out their biographical notes about Beethoven in the 18, 1830s. And they see Beethoven as a lifetime person, a genius whom they had known early, whereas Schindler sees him only in the Vienna context. Am I angry at Schindler? We should all be, is the answer for fabricating 150 falsification, falsified entries in the conversation books. That's just part of it, it's the main part. Ted Albrecht thinks there are way, there's some degree you could, of ways of thinking about Schindler that are uh, more forgiving than I'm putting it now, uh, only as a matter of hypothesizing that much of what he says might be memory and might have been based on some recollections that were true. But how to tell that that's the case is hard. So right now Schindler's uh, stature is uh, pretty low. <laughs> right, poor Schindler. <laughs> um, so I have two questions here from Guillermo Genaro Rabadan. And there are two quite different questions, but I'll put them both to you straight away. Yep. Um, so the first one is about the relationship between Beethoven's physical health and his music, for instance, claims that rhythmic tension might come from heart arrhythmia. I didn't know about that. Um, so is, is there anything that you can share about this idea of physical, the physical body and the music? And then secondly, the bigger question, how much do you think is still to be understood about Beethoven? And do you still see new evidence will be found about him that will enhance our understanding of him and his music? Mm -hmm. Uh, on the first question, I really am not qualified to say to say anything. How physical properties relate to an artist's work is a terrific question, but uh, it's not a, a, a territory that I have enough familiarity with to say anything that would be other other than irresponsible. So I won't try. Um, now, once again, the second question, Erica, for the moment, just. Give me the cue. So essentially, how much more do you think there is to discover uh, about Beethoven? Okay, fine. Um, I'll come back. With, let me start for the moment with a small, one small, wonderful example that's purely in the life, and another which is in the work. Up until about ten years ago, it was believed that Beethoven's early trip to Vienna in 1787 was two weeks long, and there's literature about that. That's all that we ever knew, and whether he met Mozart or not during that visit is a matter of continuing speculation. He might have; we're not absolutely sure, but it isn't impossible. It. Uh, in an extraordinary discovery made in Regensburg some few years ago, it was it was pointed out. Let me remind myself. Of the other. Yes. The German scholar Dieter Haberl published in a somewhat obscure place, but a remarkable article showing that in January of 1787, a young organist from Bonn named Bertenhoven, they couldn't spell everything right, got off the, the coach in Regensburg and then was on his way to Vienna. This is Beethoven. It turns out that the whole Vienna trip with Beethoven at age 16 was not two and a week or two and a half weeks in length, but something like 10 weeks in duration. It opens up an entirely different picture of what Beethoven was doing and could have been doing during that very fertile moment in his life when he's coming into his own and making his first journey out of Bonn to the great European capital, Vienna, where he's going to see and hear music made on a scale that even in Bonn was, would have been extraordinary. He's going to meet patrons, he undoubtedly, uh, he might have met Mozart, it's possible, but above all, and he may have made other journeys too into Bavaria, by the way. There is at least some hint in, uh, hinted evidence that he might have gone to the Uttigen-Wallerstein court 
which I won't say more about, but except to say it's one of the regional courts of Bavaria where music making was at a very high level. So it may have been quite a remarkable uh, trip. But 10 weeks versus two weeks is tremendously different. Does this mean people should be studying uh, uh, coach records? Yes, if you're Dieter Haberl, and he did do it. So I managed, this all discovery came long after I'd written my biography, but I managed to put it into the chapter on 1787 in this book, in which I offer three sample years discussing how life and works can be thought about in the particular context of those times. And that's where it's there. Uh, the other biographer who has certainly dealt with it is Jan Kyers in his new biography, but, and it's going to have to be thought about now as, a, as an example. So that's on the biographical side. On the works side, we have from Beethoven something probably close to 70 odd sketchbooks. How many have been effectively and responsibly published in full transcription and facsimile? A small handful on the fingers of one hand, pretty much still, maybe one and a half hands, not more. It's very hard to do, I can assure you. It takes an awful lot of work. It takes forever. It is enormously uh, rewarding to sit down and get down into the material of Beethoven's work as he is producing it. I can't describe it better than that. When I wanted to set out to try to work on the Eroica sketchbook, I was so fortunate to have the complete collaboration of Professor Alan Gossman, now of University of Arkansas, who did extraordinary work uh, on the, we both did, we both went to Krakow, we worked on the manuscript there. And of course, in our respective studio studies, and Alan made remarkable discoveries in, about the sketchbook, which nobody had thought about before, including me. For example, that there is evidence of page foldings in the manuscript, which when you look at them very carefully, show you that, I will now say if, but I really mean it's virtually a certainty that Beethoven folded the pages. And when he did so, he was able to see let's say for the opening movements of, the, of, the work, of his work on the Eroica Symphony, see his early ideas for several movements almost simultaneously in a, in over a, uh, the opening of pages next to each other, which could only happen if he, the pages were folded by him. You never know what's going to come up next is the answer. And uh, this is a field which enormously waiting for further development. I sometimes used to say to people, we can go to the moon, but we don't have the complete Beethoven sketchbooks. And now I have to say, it looks like we can go to Mars and we don't have them. I think I'll leave the solar system alone though. A friend of mine is an astronomer who works on this. He wouldn't want to hear this. Yes. Uh, wonderful. I have a question from Linda Crystal. Um, do you know why, or do we know why Carl Holtz did not write Beethoven's biography? Um, Love to know. Holtz was a very serious man, very good violinist, second violinist of the Schupanzig Quartet, a devoted Beethoven acolyte and servant and helper who, who came in after Schindler had been gotten rid of and served Beethoven extremely well and was supposed to be the first biographer. Um, there is a large scale study of Holtz by, by Karl Ulrich with two L's the only, all I can say is that Holtz's later life seems not to have enabled him to take on the job that he had hoped to do when he, when, from the early years. But why he did not, I don't know in detail right now. It would have been a good thing, I think. It could be that he did not feel he had the literary flair. It could be that it may have been a task simply beyond his capacity at the time. It would have been, healthy for the field in what we now know of, of Schindler, but he would have had to suffer the us Schindler's usual, usual merciless criticism of all his contemporaries, which we know about. Don't know beyond that. I have a question for you from Luigi Bellofato. Yes. Among all the biographies of Beethoven you've read in all these years, which one do you prefer? <laughs> 
gosh. Well, it all depends on what I'm reading for. If I'm reading for the factual dimensions of the subject, I go back to Thayer. Even it's outdated inevitably in factual terms and will, would have to be done all over again for the third or fourth or fifth time, but there are limits to that. But it was so honest in its presentation and so thorough and unpretentious that, and it let the facts speak for themselves as much as he could, that I would, I would go back to it. I don't have one single, I don't have one single favorite to offer. Of course, for what it, for, for in many dimensions, the early biographies of the, of the 20th century, and that includes, of course, Solomon, but also a great many others by, I, I offered surprisingly, probably to some readers, by the way, the extraordinary MGG article by Klaus Kropfinger, which became a book also. It is tightly packed. It is a dictionary article, but it's an extraordinary dictionary article with a great deal of, of important and interesting ideas in it. So that would be a surprise winner on, the, on that dimension of things. Uh, it depends a little on what you are looking for. If you ask, what, are the, what is the best biography of Shakespeare? The answer is, it all depends. For Shakespeare, we have almost nothing like the factual evidence we have for Beethoven. We have no manuscripts to speak of and, and of all sorts of gaps in the life, but still there are famous biographies that need to be read. Uh, I mentioned an extraordinary book on Shakespeare biography by Sam Schoenbaum. I mentioned it in my book and it's a wonderful book to read and even gave me a spur to see about writing this book, I must say at the time. No single one is the answer, depends a little on what you're looking for. I'm gonna evade the question as skillfully as I can at the moment. Okay, uh, another couple of questions have just come in. Um, from Gary Evans, which of Beethoven's works do you believe most strongly and directly encode his personal experiences at the time of composition? Mm. Directly, as close as directly, Andy Fernigalipta, I do believe, does. The time of writing it, 1815, it is three years after the Immortal Beloved crisis. And you should read the Immortal Beloved letter as a statement of crisis, as, as a letter of tremendous passionate abdication of the ideal and hope of having a truly lasting relationship with the woman he loved. It's a farewell to, to love much more than an expression in so many important ways. Three years later, he writes, this song cycle based on a set of poems by a Jewish medical student in Vienna. That's already incredible. Yalois Yaitelis. Love to know more about Yaitelis, by the way, who spent the rest of his life back in Brno in Moravia. Um, isn't the like work of a famous poet? It probably, or at least quite possibly is written for Beethoven to be able to, to have this poem, this set of poems about a distant beloved at his disposal for his purposes. I know there are other theories about what the work may have been written for, but I think it's at least possible that it still reflects in Beethoven's emotional domain, the feeling of loss and of coming to terms with the distance he must keep from allowing his emotional life to govern his creative life. A little um, footnote to that comes later in the conversation books and it's included in a number of biographies. Certainly it's included in Barry Cooper's biography very, very well. Is a statement in the conversation books about Giulietta Guicciardi when she returns to Vienna with her husband from Italy after many years. In effect, Beethoven says, and I'm, paraphrasing, she loved me more than her husband, but if I had given my life strength to that, what would have happened to the nobler and greater things? What are the nobler and greater things? Obviously, the works. 
and writing this at a time when the Ninth Symphony is coming along, he's finished the Missa Solemnis. Very likely the idea of the late quartets is at least in mind. Uh, think if we think about what that means. So there's an element of emotional sacrifice, I think, in the life story that you have to allow for. But I offer Andifani Galipta as the closest I can come to a direct or, or virtually direct connection. Thank you. Um, we are very nearly out of time. Um, so I thought I'd just ask you as a very final question, and there's lots of very nice comments in the chat, lots of thank yous to you for your previous books as well, a lot of very appreciative um, people of your work. Um, just as a final question, what do you see as the future direction for Beethoven biography or future directions? Well, I offered some thoughts in, at the end of my, of my book about that. I think an expanded understanding of how he lived in the world around him would be very helpful now. We know a lot about who his patrons were, and they were very, a very uh, interesting but curious uh, cast of characters. And not all of them were very faithful patrons. Uh, he's alleged to have said once, "Prince, what you are, you are through an you are through an accident of birth. What I am, I am through myself." We're not sure he actually said it, but many things about his life tell us it fits fits very well. Expanding understanding of how his life developed in the context of Vienna of the time, of Europe at the time of the musical developments of the time, especially in the late years, when Viennese entertainment music is coming on extremely strongly. Uh, by entertainment music, I mean the lighter music of many of his contemporaries. By the way, when I say lighter, I don't mean bad. Rossini becomes a, a, there's a Rossini craze in Vienna that Beethoven must have heard about. And Rossini even comes to see him after all. So one dimension is that in the direction of the context writ large. The recent ex excellent collection of, inter of, of mementos by people who met Beethoven by Kopitz and Kadenbach is first class. I think we need new translations of the letters now that we finally have the real letters in, in full. By the way, what can newly be discovered? The new letter of 1795 about liberty and equality and the importance of it is incredibly important. Uh, Beethoven says in a letter to a friend in Russia who's in diplomatic service, when will human beings finally be equal to one another? We will not see that. It will take hundreds of years. Not easy not to, to it. Uh, I can't forbear at the moment suggesting he was something of a seer when he said that. So here we are. So, uh, I say at the end of my book, I have suggestions about ideas, some search further developments, but they will be whatever new new scholarship wants to, to be, you know? It all depends on the angle of vision. I think I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Um, thank you for explaining some of the ideas that came out of your book and for engaging in this really interesting and quite open discussion um, with everyone who's present here. We currently have 61 in the room, so it's been a really nice, lively hour spent talking uh, with, with a leading authority on Beethoven. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I look forward to more of these events in future and hopefully before too long, we can all be in the same room as each other again too. And I want to thank you, Erica, for bringing the whole thing about and to everybody who's here today. And I'm reading a few of the little questions on, on that come up on the screen once in a while. And let's hope that we can evolve beyond screens before too long. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. All the very best. Thank you, Erica.